I try to stare at it, I don't see it. I try to cross my eyes, I can't see it. I'll try again next week, that's how it is. Anybody else staring at the screen like I don't see it? That's totally me. My name's Aaron, I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for being with us today. My wife and I, before we were married, we were engaged. That's how it goes. And we were at uh, a friend's house, they, we were playing a game and uh, this game it was just a board game. We, we loved it. It was so much fun. So much fun, in fact, that the following week, she and I were hanging out at her parents' house. And we were like, man, we really want to play this board game. But neither of us owned it. This game was called The Game of Life, Twists and Turns Edition. Okay, so maybe you've played Life, but have you played The Game of Life, Twists and Turns Edition? The difference is it has twists and turns. And it's also an electronic like Visa card thing that goes in it. And we loved it. We thought it was so much fun. And so uh, it's like 7.30 at night. We're at her parents' house. I'm like, man, I would love to play this game. And I'm slightly impulsive. I'm like, let's go find it. Let's find it. Um, And so this is about 13 years ago. This is before what we have today. Today you can like go online to a store buy it now and like pick it up in 10 minutes, right? Or do the curbside delivery. How many of you love that? I do, right? It's that whole, great. You don't have to go inside the store. This was not that. This is basically you could order it online and it could get shipped to you or you could go online and see if it was in stock at the store. You couldn't buy it and hold it. You could just see if it was in stock. So that's what we did. We go online, and I, I search for it, and in searching for it, realize, oh, this game is actually out of print, but still available if it's, like, on the store shelf, right? And so we see that it's on inventory at our local Walmart. It's about two miles away, and it says they have about three of them in stock. So that's excellent. So I'm like, let's go. So we jump in the car. We drive two miles. We go to Walmart. We go to the game section. We go down the aisle. I don't see it anywhere. It's nowhere to be found. Like maybe it's on the clearance rack, right? Because it's out of print. Maybe they're getting rid of it. Go to the clearance rack. Not there. We go to the really, really helpful uh, sales associate at Walmart. And we explain our dilemma. We say, hey, we look for this. It says it's in stock, but we don't see it anywhere. And she informs us, well, you know, sometimes that's wrong. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for that information. So, we then are like, well, maybe, maybe it's at another one. So we go and we look on our phones. We're like, okay, it says there's seven at another Walmart, like five miles away. So let's go there. This is in Raleigh. We have lots of Walmarts. So we like jump in the car. We drive to another Walmart. Same story. Two and a half, I kid you not, two and a half hours later and at least six Walmarts later, we come up empty-handed. And every single one, it said it was in stock, and it wasn't there. And that is extremely frustrating, right? I went home. I took her back to her parents' house. I go home. I'm texting her later. I'm like, I cannot sleep over this. I'm distraught. Uh, now, just as a side note, we do eventually find it. I mean, it's months later. I happen to be at a Walmart, and I, yeah, plural, and I'm walking down the aisle, And I'm like, I'm going to go to the clearance rack and just see. Something in me says it's there. And it was. It was magic. It couldn't, like, there was light shining behind it and everything. It was incredible. So I I since purchased it, and it has been sitting in the back of my closet for 10 years. And uh, so that's the end of that story. But we expect often that what we see to be what we find. And when that doesn't happen, we get frustrated. For example, you maybe have been told about a restaurant and you're excited to go. Maybe you looked at it online. You saw the pictures. The menu looks fantastic. And then you go there and you realize, oh, something has changed on the menu. Maybe the price has increased. Maybe it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. That can happen in our modern times. A lot of people buy houses or cars online. Like you see the pictures. It's like only 50,000 miles. And then you see it in person. You're like, yeah, because it was in a flood. So that's why. Like, and, and so sometimes we expect that what we see in something to be the result of what we find in something. And when those two things are not aligned, it actually causes a lot of tension or a lot of stress in our life. You know this. You've experienced it. I have experienced this. And it's not just in what we experience or in the things that we buy, it also happens in our relationships, right? 
Like if I have an expectation of another individual and I expect something to happen in that relationship or be a certain way in that relationship and it is not what I find out to be the case, that can cause a lot of tension or friction, right? The same is true when it comes to our own lives. This is called incongruent values, where we say we believe one thing or we say we prioritize something, but our life doesn't actually reflect that. When we, when we realize that, when we see our priorities are not actually matching with how we're living, it causes this tension, this incongruent value in our life because we expect what we see to be what we find. Last week, Pastor Terry kicked us off with this series of Decoded, and really what we're doing is we're looking at the stories that Jesus would tell and kind of discovering what is it that he's actually saying. Jesus would often teach in stories called parables to illustrate some principles that are still very relevant and valid today. He would teach to crowds things um, that God would want to instill in them, but he would use stories to relate it to them in a very tangible and real way. And Pastor Terry led us through some of those last week and helped us identify the principle in the parable. And we're going to continue to do that today to discover what is the principle in this parable as we discover it this morning. To set this up, you kind of have to understand what's going on. Jesus is in his ministry. He is teaching people of all kinds. He has crowds around him, religious people, people who know the law up to that point in scripture, people who are just kind of common spectators, people who are really invested and interested. There's a wide range of people that he is speaking to. He's teaching them about, hey, don't store up stuff for yourself here on earth. Be mindful that God has a bigger plan and he wants you to be involved with it. Don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And it's in this context that the crowd begins to notify Jesus of something. In a way, it, it feels like they're interrupting him almost with a news alert. If there was social media or smartphones back then, you would see it pop up on your phone. Hey, news alert, this just happened. And this crowd comes to Jesus and says, hey, what do you think about this? What's your stance on this? And we pick it up in Luke chapter 13. There were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now, there isn't a lot known about this. We don't see it mentioned anywhere else, but a lot of theologians kind of surmise and from this that basically what was going on here was that Pilate, the Roman governor of this region, was obviously in some sort of conflict with these Galileans. Galileans were loyal to Herod. They were kind of under his jurisdiction. Herod was a Jewish leader at that time who was still in subjection to Pilate. So it makes sense that perhaps there was some sort of political rivalry or tension going on with the dynamics at play there. So perhaps these Galileans were coming up against Pilate. And to make an example of whatever was going on there, Pilate had these Galileans, these Jewish people, killed, not just murdered, but murdered as they were making sacrifices. So it's like a huge deal. It's like a massive upset. And they're not bringing this to Jesus to like trick him. They're really just saying, hey, this just happened. Like, did you hear about this? What do you think of it? And so Jesus responds. He says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Jesus is posing a question. Do you think that they had some really great sin that caused this to happen? Do you think that because of their political anarchy, if that's what it was, that they deserved this thing to happen to them? Is that, is that what you're saying? You think that their sin is worse and therefore they suffered this really awful fate? Is that what you're saying? And he says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. What? If I was asking Jesus a question about like, hey, Jesus, did you hear about these guys that were killed? And then he looks at me and says, well, you know, you have to repent or else. I'd be like, what? Well, I was just asking a question, innocent. Like, I wasn't involved with the political anarchy thing, Jesus. I was just asking. I wasn't asking, like, where you fell. I was just, did you know about it? What do you think of this? But I think Jesus was seen a little bit behind the scenes there because it's true for me. I can put myself in that story, and I can look at it and say, man, if that was the news alert of the day, something in me would say, well, 
Input, output, right? You get what you deserve. I expect that if you're involved in some sort of political uprising, that you would suffer some sort of punishment for that, right? Like that just makes sense. That makes sense to us. And we, we see it in our daily news all the time, right? Like if, if you are, like if there's a gang violence issue, well then don't be in gangs. If you don't want gang violence to happen, you don't be around gangs. It just makes sense, right? We, we expect to what we see to be what we find. So did these people just get what they deserve? It just makes sense. Input, output, this causes this, cause and effect. It's just how the world is. So Jesus flips it and says, well, you might should repent. What, is Pilate going to come after us? What are you talking about? And then Jesus goes one more step further by referencing another news item of the day. He said, or do you think those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Apparently there was a tower that fell over. And it just happened. A tragic accident. And it killed 18 people. Was that because of some sin in their life? Did they deserve that? So whether it's tragedy or whether it's cause and effect, did they deserve that? Listen, Jesus says, it doesn't matter. I just tell you all, you have to repent or you will all perish in the same way. Does that mean a tower is going to fall on us? Jesus, are you saying that Pilate's going to send his soldiers after us? Like, what are you getting at? And those are the questions that I would be asking. Jesus is kind of turning it on its head a little bit because sometimes We expect a certain result based on what we see. And here's what we do. I do this. I'm just going to throw myself under the bus here. I see a result. I know nothing else about it, but I see a result of something, and therefore I assume certain events took place, certain behaviors happened, and then I make a judgment call. And in my mind I say, well, what else do you expect? That's what I expect would happen, right? Do you ever do that? I feel like we do that all the time. It's so easy to do that. And Jesus is saying, listen, rather than assuming things and rather than judging, let's do something different. Let's take a look at you. That seems like a really harsh turn. But then Jesus follows it up with this parable, this story. And here's what it is. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. That's the end of the story. That's it. Now, often when Jesus would tell a story, one of his friends or followers would say, hey, uh, can you explain that for us? And he would. That does not happen in this case. Instead, we are simply to take this story at face value for what it is. So that's what we're going to do today as we look at this story. So a couple of things to note off the bat here. We have a fig tree in a vineyard. Now, these two things are often related because what people would do is plant a fig tree, and if the soil was good, that fig fig tree would thrive, and then a vineyard, they would know, could be planted around it. It would let them know, hey, this is good soil. This fig tree is doing well, good soil. Let's go ahead and put the vineyard here. And so that is kind of the scenario that I imagine we are encountering in this story. We have a fig tree, and it is established. That's important to know. There is a vineyard already grown up around it. This is not a new fig tree, because a fig tree will take about three to five years to start producing fruit. And this tree, at some point, was producing fruit. Otherwise, it would make no sense for the owner to come and expect to see fruit in year one or two or three. So this is a tree that is firmly established in this place, at some point has been producing fruit in the past, but for whatever reason, the last few years has had nothing produced on it. The other thing to note is that this tree is still alive and looks healthy. Because if it wasn't alive and looking healthy after year one, it would have been rooted out, right? We would have just chopped it down right then. 
But this is a tree that looks like it should be producing fruit. Otherwise, he wouldn't go up to it year after year after year expecting to see fruit on it. There's another story in Scripture where Jesus does this same thing himself, where he sees a fig tree, it looks healthy, he goes to it, he sees there's no fruit on it, and he actually curses it, and it withers and and dies. So this is a fig tree that looks healthy and should be producing fruit, but isn't. But it's still alive. The other thing is that the owner expected to find fruit on it. Which means he knows that something's been going on with it year after year, but it still looks healthy. It still looks like it should be thriving. Let's give it another chance next year. Let's give it another chance next year. Let's give it another. So he is expecting, he's going to it looking to find fruit, and he doesn't find it. So the problem with this tree is actually under the surface. There is something happening in the root system of this tree that is causing it not to produce fruit. The problem is in the root system itself. What is happening beneath the surface of this tree? And they know it's something beneath the surface of this tree. Remember what the vintner said. He said, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then we'll cut it down. So, We know that they know there's something going on underneath it. There's something blocking something in this tree. And that is frustrating for the owner, frustrating for the vintner, because we expect what we see to be what we find. If I expect to see fruit on a healthy fig tree, then I should find fruit on a healthy fig tree. And when that doesn't happen, something doesn't connect. So what is it? Now, this is not about towers falling on people. This is not about a a governor murdering people. There is something more going on here that Jesus is trying to relay because remember what he said. He said, unless you repent, you too will all perish. So what is the connection that Jesus is trying to make for us? Now, in looking at this story of the last uh, 10 days or so, I have read more about fig trees than I thought I would ever need to read about. And I am not a horticulturist. I don't even know if I said that word right. Uh, I'm not good at uh, gardening or maintaining plants. I'm really good at ignoring them and letting them die. I'm really good at that. But I was wondering, like, what would cause a fig tree to look healthy but actually not produce fruit? What would cause that? And so I started researching a lot of sciencey journals and universities and like figuring out people that had done studies, like this whole world where people care about this. And uh, I was looking at some of these articles and some of them are way over my head. But I found a few reasons why this might happen. One might be the climate itself. But if that was the case, then this tree would have already been withered and dead. Um, So it's not that. So then I started looking, well, what what would cause this? And I found this, root, not nematodes. That's a really fun phrase to say. I encourage you to try it right now. Root, not nematodes. Some of you, you don't trust me. I'm telling you it's fun to say. Go ahead. Root, not nematodes. See how fun that is? Now say it five times fast. Root, not nematodes. Don't do that. I'm just kidding. You can later. Root knot nematodes. These are like microorganisms that attach themselves to the roots of the of the fig tree. And what these root knot nematodes do is they actually take the nutrients out of the soil that should otherwise be directed to the tree itself and more or less suck the life out of the soil and rob the tree of it. So the tree might still look healthy, but over time, it's not going to produce any fruit. And left unattended will actually kill the tree itself. It's a fascinating thing. I read way more about it, but there's one thing that I found that that was like, okay, this is, I can digest this, and I wanted to share it with you. This is what one journal said. There is no real cure for figs with root, not nematodes. Once an infestation takes hold, the best course of action is to fertilize vigorously. This will encourage root growth and hopefully give the tree enough uninfected roots with which to take in nutrients. Even this 
is just delaying the inevitable, however. It's this idea that these root knot nematodes are literally going to suck the life out of this tree. Now, we can fix it. We can try to root them out and we can try to punch in a bunch of nutrients into the soil. And when we do that, it's not going to keep this tree from dying one day. The tree is eventually going to die. But while it is still here, if we continue to do that, it is going to be actively producing fruit again. Now that sounds pretty incredible. In fact, that's exactly what the vintner said he was going to do. Remember what he said, leave it alone one more year. I'll dig around it. Let's dig out all of those roots that are like poison. Let's fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then we'll cut it down. I find this a really fascinating analogy that Jesus is using. The idea that we could look healthy and yet not be producing fruit. Jesus referred to to himself as life right? And that in him we can have life, but not just have life, have an abundant life. Not just look healthy, not just look like we have it together, but actually have an abundant life that is producing fruit. As followers of Jesus, we should expect to see fruit produced in our lives. That's the expectation that's there. So what happens in our lives that sometimes causes that fruit not to be produced for a year, two years, three years? Again, looks healthy, but when we take a close inspection, we see, man, there's actually no fruit there. Unless we forget, let's ask Paul. Paul gives us an insight into some of the fruit of the Spirit. Here's what he says. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there's no law. The idea that we would cultivate these things in our life through his spirit, that we would have love in our life. And here's the thing, it's not love in our life just for us. You understand the purpose of producing fruit in our lives is for the benefit of others. Do we benefit? Yes, absolutely. But the love, the joy, the peace in my life is meant to be shared with others. It is not meant to be kept to myself. In fact, if I do keep it to myself, that is the beginnings of a root, not nematode. And over time, it will suck the nutrients out of my soul, and I will just be a healthy little tree, but I will not be producing any fruit whatsoever. And now that can stifle us, right? Like, what is that that causes that? I mean, the, the fruit that should be in our lives is meant to be shared. So what are the things that maybe trip us up in our life sometimes? What are the things in our life that could be root, not nematodes in our life? Have you ever thought about that? And listen, it's not just... It's not just things that we know are wrong. Okay, so I've been following Jesus since I was about six years old. I've been following him, and I can look in my life, and I can say, wow, there's lots of moments where, man, that uh, is definitely sin, and, and I need to get rid of that in my life. But sometimes there's things happening in my life that, that maybe uh, I aren't just like active sin, but it's things that I know that I should be doing that I'm not doing, Right? That's also sin. If you grew up in church, you heard sins of commission, sins of omission. That's just a fancy way of saying, sometimes I do things that I know are wrong, and sometimes I don't do things that I know I should be doing. Jesus' story is actually just echoing something that his cousin John would preach before Jesus started his ministry. When John was in the wilderness preparing the way for Jesus, teaching people, saying, hey, the kingdom of God is coming... John would say, hey, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. These two ideas are connected. The idea that fruit would be produced in my life is connected directly to the idea of repentance. They go together. And what's interesting about that phrase, in keeping with repentance, it's active. It's not past tense. 
in keeping with. It means they're happening together at the same time. Repentance means that I am walking one direction, maybe in my own interests and what I think I should be doing. Uh, My words are mine. My feet are mine. My resources, everything's mine. It's all about me. And repentance is I'm going to stop full 180. What is it that God wants me to do? What is it that Jesus wants me to do in this situation with this person? And that is a complete 180. It is repentance. It means I stop moving one direction and I start moving another direction. Sometimes our repentance is I'm just going to stop. But we never make the turn to actively start pursuing what it is that Jesus wants for us to do. You understand? Here's the other thing. I told you, I, I've been following Jesus since I was six. The moment I stop repenting of something, I am giving opportunity for root knot nematodes to come into my life. The moment I stop feeling the need to repent or I think I have arrived or I think, man, that's not a problem for me or whatever it might be, I am allowing root knot nematodes to get into the root of my soul and say, yeah, you got it all together. You don't need to do anything else. You can just sit. You can just coast. There's nothing else for you. Here's a question. Who is following Jesus more closely today because of your influence on them yesterday? If we're supposed to be actively producing fruit in our lives, this is a good question, right? Who is following Jesus more closely today because of your influence on them yesterday? It doesn't mean they have to be like super Christian. I'm just asking, who is taking one more step towards Jesus today because of your influence yesterday? When we look for fruit in our lives, do you know what some of us do? I have a mentor who who taught me this. Sometimes when we look for fruit in our lives, if someone was to ask us that question, especially if we've been following Jesus for a while, what we like to do is we like to go to our pantry and we'll pull out some dried fruit that's been sitting in there for a while. Or maybe we'll go to the freezer and we'll pull out a bag of fruit from there. Or maybe we go down to the cellar, if we have those anymore, and we get like our canned fruit that we jarred a long time ago. When we ask this question, man, who is actively following Jesus one step closer today because of your influence yesterday? Do you have to go down to the cellar to answer that question or is there fresh fruit in your life right now? That's the question that Jesus is asking. That's the question that he's asking us to ask of ourselves. What are the root not nematodes in my life that need to be rooted out so that fruit can be actively produced in my life? That is an important question. In fact, it is the question. And I can point to other things in my world, the goings on, to say this equates that, like this makes that happen, and they deserve that, and maybe it's warranted, maybe it's not, maybe they're sinning, and then Jesus says, no, 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 forget all the distraction, forget all the noise, let's talk about you. What are you doing to be obedient to me, to actively help other people follow Jesus? Where is the fruit in your life that is not just for your benefit, but it's for the benefit of his people and for the benefit of the world around you? What are the root not nematodes in your life? And sometimes they're really small. Again, root not nematodes are like microscopic organisms, right? And it's almost too late when you find them. So isn't it better for us to identify them really quickly, as soon as we can? and rid ourselves of them. I told you some are like really big and obvious, like we can see that, but there's some that take root in different ways. And this is just me thinking out loud some examples. One would be in our time. If I say that following Jesus is super important and I don't spend time in his word or time in prayer with him, then guess what? That's a root, not nematode that I need to get out. I need to dig down, get it out, and pack it in with good stuff and start spending time in his word. Maybe it's just a few minutes each day. If it's zero and I start with a few minutes, that's great. Maybe I only read my Bible once a week and I say, you know what, I need more of a reading plan. So I'm going to follow one of those. There's plenty available on like YouVersion, our Bible app. We can direct you to those. But maybe you need a more structured reading plan to help you. Maybe prayer isn't just at mealtime or just at bedtime. Maybe you need to figure out how can I actively spend good time in prayer seeking God's heart 
spending time worshiping him in my own life, in my family, like at home? What does that look like so that when I come together with the body of Christ, that, that is already just primed in my life? What does that look like in spending time with God? Is it reflective of that? Remember, is it incongruent? Do I say it's important, but I don't have evidence of that? Is there that tension there? Maybe it's in my resources, like I know it's all his and it all belongs to him, but yet I'm holding on to it really tight and I am not opening myself to allow his uh, generosity to flow through me into the world around me through his church to have a kingdom impact, to have an impact in my community, to have an impact in my world. Like, am I holding on to it? Am I making my resources mine? The second I do that, that's a root not nematode in my life. And not just with financial things, I'm talking about with your skill set. If you have skills that are of use in the body and you're not contributing to the body by serving in some way or serving in our community and you're just saying, well, I'm just going to kind of sit here. I know that God has given me this, but I'm just going to kind of suck in the soil. I'm just going to take up space. He's coming along. He's saying, no, 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 let's root that out. Let's produce fruit in your life. Let's see something. We have an opportunity to do that. Is it with our words? Are my words blessing? Are my words full of life? You understand that in our world there is plenty of gloom, there is plenty of despair, there is plenty of negativity, and we are kingdom people. If you're a follower of Jesus, that means you have a different language. That means your words should always speak hope and peace to those who need to hear it. Are your words reflective of active fruit being produced in your life? What about your relationships with the people you work with, your family, your kids, your spouse, your teachers, whatever it might be? Can you look at those relationships and say, man, these are relationships that in small, tiny ways are leading people closer to Jesus one step at a time? Or are we just kind of hanging out? That's a root, not nematode. We've got to dig that out. At Ocean View, we kind of categorize things this way. We like to organize things as people. Some of us are really good at organizing. Some of us work really hard at it. And here we've kind of organized these things around these three dials, up, in, and out. And the reason we call them dials is because it's the idea they can always be turned. There's always another step to take. There's always more that we can do because we never fully arrive in our relationship with Jesus. We never fully arrive as his followers because it is supposed to be active. And so that up dial is my relationship with God. What's a turn or a step that I need to take in that? Maybe it's, man, I check in with my local church maybe once a month. Maybe I need to ratchet that up to two or three times a month. Maybe in my giving it's kind of been sporadic, but instead I need to ratchet that up and really trust him. I say I trust him, but my life doesn't reflect that, so I'm going to start trusting him more. Maybe it's in our worship, and our whatever it is. And here's the thing, you never fully arrive, so there's always another turn that you can make in that. Maybe it's in the in dial. The in is simply just our relationship with God's people. Maybe it's, hey, you know what? I, I've been serving on this specific team for a while and now I'm just going to turn that up and I'm going to start serving a little bit more or I'm going to use a different skill for this team. Maybe you've been coming and you're like, man, I haven't engaged with the body at all and maybe your next thing is, I'm just going to say, hey, I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to do whatever needs to be done. I'm going to start little and I'm going to start though. I'm not going to be content to just sit anymore. Maybe it's finding a group You've been coming and you've been anonymous. You've kind of been coming in and out. And maybe your next step is just say, you know what? I want to be known. I want to know people. And so you engage with the group that can edify you and support you and come alongside you and you grow together with them. Maybe it's that out dial of saying, you know what? I, I want to engage more with our community. I want to serve our community in some way. I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Maybe I want to partner with our local partners, our international partners in some way. Maybe it's just saying, you know what? I have neighbors that don't know Jesus. I want to be more intentional about helping them know Jesus. Maybe that's the turn that you need to make. Whatever it is, here's the thing. It's going to be different for all of us because we're all at different places. That's not the point. The point is, are we going to be obedient to the step that he calls us to take? Here's what I love about this story, and I was reading through it again last night, and it hit me, this clicked to me yesterday. Jesus said, like, hey, don't forget this. This is one more thing. He leaves it right there. The story ends. There's no follow-up. 
Jesus doesn't come back at the end of that story and say, hey, you know what? He came back the next year and the tree was flourishing with fruit. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say the owner came back next year and there was still no fruit, so they chopped it down. He doesn't say that. He just kind of leaves it. He just says, hey, here it is. Here's the problem. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what the Spirit of God can do to help you fix that problem. Are you going to do it? That's it. So he really leaves it up to us, doesn't he? To be confronted with some root knot nematodes in our life and to dig them out and just say yes to the next step. And I get it. There's going to be a lot of disruptions in our following of Jesus. Maybe you were like that tree. You were fruitful at some point and something happened. Maybe life changed, job changed, family changed. Maybe a worldwide pandemic came along and threw you off course. I don't know. It's different for all of us, right? Life's crazy. It's complicated. But year after year goes by, is there fruit in your life? Here's the great thing. Jesus is giving us an opportunity right now, today, to start changing that. And it's just by saying yes, little by little by little. So I don't know what it looks like for you. I don't know what your next step is. But I do know that if we ask him to reveal it to us, he will, that his spirit will come alongside us and and tell us exactly what it is. Maybe for some of us in this room, it's like, you know what? I've never actually even given my life to Jesus. I've never trusted him as my Lord and Savior. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's you've made that decision, but you haven't gone public with that through baptism. Maybe it's you're, you're, you're just been coming, but now you're ready to take another step. Maybe you know what it is, and you've just been holding back. Whatever it is, Jesus is giving us the opportunity right now today to root it out, to put good stuff in, and to start walking and living in active repentance, which produces fresh fruit in our lives. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this incredibly just simple story on the surface, but there's so much there, God, that you you would give us opportunity to pause and reflect and look into our lives and our hearts and just see the ways that maybe we have left this unattended in our spirit and we have allowed things to attach themselves to the root system in our life and they are beginning to choke us out. We are now having opportunity to stop producing fruit. God, would you allow us the opportunity now as you so graciously give us to repent and in keeping with repentance, God, we produce fruit little by little, day by day. God, we ask your spirit right now. I ask you for me. I ask you for this body, those who who call you their own, that are followers of you, that you would reveal to them through your spirit the next step they need to take. Just the next step. And that as you reveal it, as you speak so clearly, whether it's sharing Jesus with a neighbor, God, maybe it's taking the next step in serving or giving or worshiping, whatever it might be, God, just reading your word, whatever it is, God, as you reveal it, would you allow us then also and equip us with your spirit to be obedient to it? You rejoice in that. Jesus, we want to be followers who live an abundant life. We want to be a church that understands what it means to produce fruit, not for ourselves, but for the vineyard that is around us, that is growing. God, let our lives be an indicator of what you are doing, what you are capable of. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for this. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray.